know, you're much more grounded in who you are as an individual. And it's because of all of those experiences. All day. I mean, adversity really builds you, you know, and like I've said before, pressure makes diamonds. And so, you know, if you if you know you, you have that value, man, you just got to accept that pressure. And we're live, cuzzo. Live and direct. Hit him with that intro. <laughs> Welcome back, man, to the Electors Podcast. This will be episode 22. 23. 23? Oh, yeah. man, I'm always yeah, I'm always one episode behind. But that means that's a good thing, though. That means that we're shooting a lot, and that we're trying to pump yeah. out these episodes as much as we can for you guys. And uh, we have uh, another special guest today. We have Alex Perez here with us. Welcome, uh, brother. Aurora, Welcome. Aurora's own. You know, uh, he's he's uh, in the city now. You know, he forgot about the little people. No, I'm just kidding. 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 But uh, no, we're thankful to have him here, and uh, we're going to get into a few different topics. We're going to cover um, a little bit of uh, some politics, some of the stuff that he has working on, as well as uh, some grassroots stuff, and uh, just, yeah, just have a conversation. So with that being said, man, first and foremost, once again, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for being here. I'm having me here. And uh, let's get right into it, man. Um, yes, wanna- so tell, tell us a little bit about your background, man. Where you from? Where'd you grow up? Yeah. Uh, born and raised in Aurora, Illinois. Uh, grew up on the east side. I'm from Sophisburg. Grew up on the east side with my grandparents and my mom. So uh, Sophisburg and then Grove Street. Those are the two streets in, in Aurora that I grew up on primarily. Um, went to East or I went to Cowherd. Sorry, I went to let me back it. I went to Johnson Elementary School. That's where I started my elementary school. Okay. Then went to Cowherd Middle School and then from there East Aurora High School. Yep. Uh, graduate class of 20, 2010. Shout out to class of 2010. Yeah. We'll probably never meet with each other because I think we all hate each other. But <laughs> just know that I love most of you all and I hope everybody's still good. Shout out to class of 2010. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I went to uh, Wabonzi Community College. Shout out to Wabonzi too, man. Shout out to all my people at Wabonzi. Um, then from there, I went to um, I went to uh, Columbia College, got mm-hmm. my my BA, mm-hmm. and then went to Aurora University, got my uh, my master's, um, my nice, MBA. Nice. And uh, that's like my educational background. Working, I started as an intern working for the city of Aurora. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I think I got to like politics and, and governmental work. Um, worked there for like, what, like five years. Um, worked out of the Shout out to the old TV station, Wayne's World. I don't know if anybody still knows that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that World. worked in the mayor's office. Went from there, went to the a school district one twenty nine. I had to switch sides a little bit. They listen, they were paying, so like <laughs> I know East Side all day. Listen, I right, get it, right, but right, hey, right. they was cutting the check, so I was like, listen, West is best for a little bit, <laughs> for a little for, <laughs> yeah. for the time being. Yeah. Um, from there, uh, I just dipped out to Chicago, and just kind of just started chasing chasing opportunities and dreams out there, and it's it's been great. It's been great, man. Nice. How's that been going in in the city? Is it different? A lot different than being here in Aurora. There are differences, yes. I will say there are there are definitely me and Malcolm were talking about earlier. There's definitely differences. Um, one being that like green space. Mm-hmm. So like right behind my uh, apartment, like we're fortunate enough. We live in a really great area. Shout out to Bronzeville. Shout out to the community, man. Love. Shout out to uh, Forty Six and Vincennes Block Club. I rock with y'all. Love y'all. Um, but we're right behind um, uh, Community Garden, and it's pretty dope. But in Chicago, there are green spaces. Obviously, in the more denser areas, there's green space as a commodity, like I was telling Malcolm. But in the South Side, there are spaces, but there's not a lot of spaces that you can utilize, right, um, for right. like that type of communal gathering and, and, and growing of things and sharing of knowledge mm-hmm. and culture. Mm-hmm. And so to be like living right behind one where the whole block is involved and like they throw like community gatherings all the time, it's just dope. Um, you don't really see a lot of that out here, at least like when I was growing up in Aurora. Right, right. I don't, I don't, there are some community gardens that I'm aware of, but they're not like a focal point, I guess, within the community. And mm-hmm. I think that's because the, like the difference is where in the city, you know, folks tend to like, you know, it's again, green space is not usable. Green space is not in abundance. Right. So when you have a space like that, people really cherish it. They really enjoy it. They come together, they're really trying to protect that. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's a definitely a difference. And everybody has cars. <laughs> yeah. Everybody has cars. Yeah. Like I, I know more neighbors that don't have cars um now than i when i was living in aurora like you know just about everybody had a car or was trying to get a car because right. you know everything's spread out there's yeah, so yeah. much everything's just spread out vastly out here versus in the city everything's, yeah. you know you got to be a little more compact everything needs to be a little more accessible and reachable so nice those are some of the differences nice uh, now you did know. you did you ever see yourself as a gardener nah never yeah. never <laughs> yeah. which is funny because like my like i said my grandparents you know they live in the township so they got like a little piece of land they just they garden and stuff they do a lot of gardening but uh-huh. i never got anything like i would help them move the like the motion or the the was the soil and whatnot yeah i never there was never actually interest until now you know i got you know my i was with my son and my wife and 
we're gardening. They, they they were gracious enough to block club to give us a little plot. And so, so let's try it. And we try it, man. It was so therapeutic, man. Yeah. yeah I was tripping. I feel bad because yeah. I used to like, I used to like talk smack. Like there's no way gardening yeah, can be funny. therapeutic. Yeah. And here I am. I had to call my boy. He's like yep. a plant doula. I was like, I apologize, bro. This, this is real. Like yeah. I, I felt very like relaxed. <laughs> oh yeah, that. man. No, yeah. What man. are you planting over there? Um, Right now we plant some peppers. We planted some, I listen, I like to make steaks. I love on Friday mm-hmm. night after a long week. Listen, yeah, I've seen some of your, I've seen some of your, try, your Chef man. Ramsey uh, <laughs> videos Ramsey. you made, you know, for That's IG. Man. He throws down. Bobby no, Flay. I'm coming down. for you, baby. I'm coming. He does. Um, <laughs> he throws down. I love, so I planted some rosemary um, uh-huh. in there. So I like, you know, throw some organic rosemary on the, on the steak and whatnot. But uh, yeah, some rosemary, mm-hmm. some peppers, uh, tomatoes, uh, small little heirloom grape tomatoes. So, we're starting small. We don't want we we know it's a it's a it's a marathon. You know what I'm saying? It's right, not right. A race. We gotta yeah. just build right. it up, right? So yeah. we starting small. See how how it goes. We still got a little bit more land to use. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, nice, that's man. what's up, man. You gonna start gardening soon? I think so, man. I, honestly, so like my my girlfriend and I, we've talked about this before. Like we eventually would love to have a nice piece of land where we could garden. You yeah, know, because I, I, I mean, I, with with everything that you see happening in in America with all the health issues and different things like that. Um, you know, more doctors are saying it is probably better if you can grow your own food, right. you know, and try to get it as close to, you know, uh, organic standard as possible. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see us having, you know, a whole entire I know, like like a super farm, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not saying it's going to be anything big like that, but, you know, maybe something like a 10 by 10, you know, you go. That's not bad. And get, you know, That's a good your, start. your veggies, your spinach, right. your kale, your stuff like that. Get some you know? chickens. Put some eggs. I now mean, maybe to the, to the compound. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe, back, maybe, though. get a maybe. one or two, I mean, man. Just I get mean, one or two in a roostery. I'm right? not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's not a possibility. <laughs> Is it expensive you know? to buy some chickens out here? Is that I don't know. I think chickens are cheap. I think, I think chickens prob- are cheap. Like the actual chicken. It's cheap, but I, I'd be honest. I'd have to do way more research on like yeah. how to raise chickens, how to. You that's know, a whole different sure ball game, right? Yeah, there. that's a whole I, different. Because then ball I think game. like I would. Then you got to ask, okay, you want free range chickens? You want right. cake, you know? Right. You want to put them in <laughs> what are we do with the eggs that come out of that? Yeah, yeah man. You know, it's a whole business model we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. true, man. That's but with true. that being said, man, um, let's segue into to something else, man. That I think is is huge. Obviously, yesterday. Uh, we're shooting on Monday today, which is actually Juneteenth, right? So happy Juneteenth, um, everybody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, but yesterday was Father's Day. And, you know, you have a one-year-old, correct? 13 months, yeah. 13 yeah, months? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. See, see, that's interesting. Like, all the parents, it's always, like, in the, in no, the first I, see, I was I was indoctrinated. Like, <laughs> you my, indoctrinated? my wife and yeah. every other parent indoctrinated gotcha. me because I can't, you can't say one-year-old. Like, uh-huh. like, they look at you like, excuse yeah. me, like, 13 yeah. months. I'm like, okay, listen, I'm sorry. You got to be politically correct. Right, 13 months. Please <laughs> please don't hurt me. Right. So w- what's that been like, man? You're, and this is your second Father's Day, but what's that been like, being a father and, and being in politics at the same time? It's challenging. It is definitely challenging. Um, I'm just by nature, like, I'm a guy that goes, go, go, you know, I'm, I, I'm cut from the same cloth as, like, my grandfather. That man's going to die working. And so I kind of, like, I hope to not have my work consume as much of my life, like, as it has for my grandfather. But mm-hmm. I just know that, you know, it's something that I enjoy doing and I like to work. But at the same time, like, now that I'm married, you know, I have a wife and kid, um, it is difficult because you really, you, you have to maintain them as well, right? Um you want to make sure that they're good at, at all times, but at the same time, like being an elected official, like you have other, you have constituents, you have community members that have elected you to a position to represent them and make sure that they're good too. Right. And so it is, it is tough, especially when you throw a kid in the mix, a young kid too. Um, first time being a dad, it's 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 all uncharted waters to me. Like you could read every book out there, you could watch every YouTube video out there, uh, until you're actually like in it. Mm-hmm. It's it's really hard um, to grasp that concept and grasp like the amount of energy and time and dedication that you need to commit um but it, but it's at the same time besides it being challenging because it is a challenge it's extremely rewarding it, it is like i i didn't really see myself as a parent you mm-hmm. know when i was when i was growing up, i was like man i ain't trying to have no kids but <laughs> you know once i had you know julian my son that really changed you know i think for me it was a little strange because a lot of the the guys that have kids they were telling me like you know when you first meet your kids it can change your life Mm-hmm. And when I first saw my kid, I was like, "Wow!" And then that was like <laughs> the initial reaction. Yeah. I was like, "Wow!" I'm holding a, I'm holding a, like a human being in my hands. Yeah. yeah. Um. But it wasn't like this, you know, crazy moment for me. It was more like a build up to more more moments. And so, gotcha. like slowly but surely, you know, I think the bond 
you know, between my son and I has grown stronger. Um, but I just want to be there and try to, you know, we talk about being present yeah. and just, I try to be as present as possible. I understand that there's, there's days and nights where I'm working till like one in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has a bedtime. Mm. He's, he's got to be in bed by seven thirty. So that, that also makes it challenging because I only have like a small window from like what time I get off from my regular job at five, Right. you know, making dinner. I make dinner for everybody. And then we got to get him ready to go to bed. So like during the week, I don't really get a lot of time to spend one-on-one with him. So I try to carve out time like on Sundays where I like, this time this amount of time is just for the fam you know mm-hmm. and um yeah that's it's it, it is an ongoing challenge it's mm-hmm. something that's never really going to go away um but i hope we'll, let, we'll I'll, I'll have i'll have him tell me later on like how it goes. yeah but I, I hope i'm doing a good i think i'm yeah. doing a, a okay job if i had to give myself well i'll have him rate me later on when he's like when right. he's able to do it like you know hopefully gives me five you know five stars, five stars would recommend <laughs> um for the for the next kid <laughs> yeah if we end up having a next kid yeah, yeah. five stars will recommend but um I, I think i'm doing an okay job Nice. Man. I, now you bring up possibly a second, second or maybe third. Do you guys? Would you guys like to have more? We have talked about it. Like mm-hmm. I, honestly, if you ask me right now, I'm one and done, baby. Like, yeah. like if you yeah. ask me right now, I'm one and done. <laughs> but you know yeah. that that could change. You know, I the possibility is 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 out there. Mm-hmm. I think you know we had a kid at at an age where it's like we're still not old but we're not like extremely young anymore but we're yeah. right in the middle so like if we do decide to have another kid you know the next like three four years like we're solid we could do mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. so i think that's a good enough window for us to explore you know what life is with like one child yeah and then should we decide to want to have another one we still have a, a, ni- a nice window where we're like you know what let's do it nice so nice, yeah nice. it's it's yeah because I, I, the reason why I said it is because I've, I've heard people say, like, oh, well, you don't want your kid to, like, have only child syndrome. Everybody hits me with that. Yeah. And, I, and I don't even have kids, and I hear it sometimes. <laughs> like, they're like, well, if, you, if you're if you going to have one, you might as well have two. Everybody you know? keeps saying that. But here's the thing, man. They're expensive. Like, come yeah, on. <laughs> they cost true. some coin. True. True. They cost yeah. some coin, man. And, and, and that's something you really have to think about, especially in this day and age when we're talking about, like, the onset of a possible recession. We're talking about sure. inflation. You know, everything costs you more. Like, you really have to take that into, into consideration, too. Um, you know, but don't let that stop you. You know, for folks that right. have one that want to have a second one, don't right. let that stop you. Right. Um, you know, for me and my wife, it's just more like we're, we're looking at the timing. Now. Like we, now that we've got our first one, you know, we wanted to have a kid, mm-hmm. had our kid. Okay, mm-hmm. now we take back, take a step back and analyze. Like, do we want a second one? If we do want one, okay, what's the window? And that's the beautiful thing, you know, about having a partner that like supports you and you guys are on the same page for the most part. Like, you guys can sit back and look at those things together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it just makes for a much better experience overall. Shout out to wifey. Shout out to wifey. Shout out, shout out, shout out to wifey. <laughs> yeah, because that's huge, man. Time is uh, time is is probably the most difficult thing to manage over money. Because sometimes, like you said, two hours, two and a half hours, that's not a whole lot. It's not a you whole know, that kind of that could suck. Because if you throw another one in there, mm-hmm. now you got you, you know you got to split it up right, now. Right. So yeah, that that's probably the biggest. Hurdle, hurdle is managing time no it makes sense yeah. man it makes sense and then also too and david talks about this a lot like with his daughters different personalities yep. you know you have one kid who maybe is more not, not clingy in a bad way but that just wants more dad time yeah, right and then the other one is just like okay you know his oldest now is getting to an age where she kind of is wants her little independence, independence you know yeah. and so it's finding that balance yeah. you know so but yeah man and then aside so aside from challenges uh, running for office, you know, kids and family life. What are the challenges inside the arena, and so, or so to speak, when you're inside, you're you're already on campaigns, you're in the office. Yeah. What are those challenges like? I mean, t- equally tough. I will say that. I mean, you know, we made history on February 28th of this year. We made history by electing uh, people that are from the community to represent us in all things police related in the city of Chicago. And that's a huge thing. You know, people have been fighting for that for like 50 years. Yeah. And so um, to have that finally pass has been an amazing thing. And, you know, and that's what captivated, captivated me to want to pursue this. Mm-hmm. Um, but the challenge is that it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's not for the faint of heart, you know. Right. Um, it, the crazy part is that it's a part-time job, but we're putting in full-time hours, full-time work. Right. Um, and we do get paid, not even close to what we should be getting paid. But right. you know, I didn't, I didn't come in this for the money, and I came in it for the opportunity to do something dope that's never been right. done before, um, and to give the community, give my community, um, something better. You know, yep. and it is a challenge because you're, we're, we're building the ship as we're sailing, and we're, you know, we're building the plane. Whatever analogy you want right. to associate to yeah. it, it's, it's being built while we're in the air, in the yeah. sea. You know, and, and that's gonna, you know, 
leaks are going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, some boards that might pop out a little bit that you thought were secure. Mm -hmm. um, and that's happening, you know, mm -hmm. and it's going to continue to happen. Um, but you just got to stay, you know, you got to stand steady, you know, mm -hmm. like, like everybody said, you got to stay 10 toes down, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. um, especially because, you know, with our office, unfortunately, I've said this before, in other interviews, like the mayoral uh, campaign mm -hmm. took a lot of, you know, took precedence, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of the media, most of the media was focused on the mayoral, you know, election, you know, mm -hmm. you had Brandon Johnson, Paul mm -hmm. Valles, mm -hmm. and, you know, Lori. Um, and then you had the automatic elections too, which typically are always number two. Mm -hmm. Well, you throw a third one in the mix and this mm -hmm. obscure one that, you know, even though it was voted on, nobody really knows about it. And so mm -hmm. we were dealing with a lot of misinformation, people just not knowing, people mm -hmm. just really confused. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with the byproduct of that now mm -hmm. where, you know, if you see some of the other district counselors that where they're having meetings in their district, you know, people are upset, they're confused. What is this? Ha like, you know what I mean? And, and that is because just folks just didn't want to talk about us. Um, and that's one of the big challenges is just educating people, man. Like before we can even get started on our work, it's educating people on who we are, what we are, why we exist, why this ordinance uh, came about. Mm -hmm. um, and just, yeah, just educating them. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges. Why, why do you think that some of the community, I shouldn't say why some of the community, but um, why it's so difficult sometimes for, for the community to trust people in office and people that are running and so on and so forth? You know what? Listen, I've had, I've gotten this question before, and we were campaigning. People I would ask me like, "Why? Why should I care? Yeah. Why should I care about you specifically? Right? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do different?" Um, and and I got to get the same answer is like, you, you're totally right in your feeling to mm -hmm. not trust folks. Mm -hmm. It's we've seen time and again, whether it's local or national news, elected officials not doing their job, right. not caring about the community, really just being in it for themselves. So. Right. All that, all that anger and confusion is totally warranted. I'm never gonna fight nobody because there are mm -hmm. times when I feel the same way, exact same way. But I ran to try and challenge that. Right. You know, I really wanted to. I didn't want to sit on the sidelines and just be another person that's just talking. Right. I wanted to. I wanted. I think there's enough of that. I wanted to actually get in the game. I felt like I had the uh, have the ability to commit to this, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to see. Okay, what does it look like on the inside? You know, mm -hmm. how how bad is it? How good is it? Whatever. I wanted to be. You know, boots on the ground and, and see it firsthand. And you know, people are mad because it's another layer of bureaucracy. People mm -hmm. are saying, oh, here, here's another office that mm -hmm. we're, our taxpayer dollars are going to go to pay some mm -hmm. more people mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. do nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I think they're wrong in that, in the, in the fact that we're not going to do anything. We are going to do something. Right. Um, unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, this is based on individuals, right? So right. it's going to be, you're going to be either as strong or as weak as the individuals that are representing you, sure. right? Um, I think in our district, uh, in, a, in a bunch of other districts, there are some very strong individuals that are really about their business and really care for the community and are doing this for the right reasons. But there are uh, folks in other in other districts that, are, you know, it's questionable. Mm -hmm. But I think it really the, the beautiful thing about this is it really falls on the individual and the people can hold us accountable. Right. You know, the people are we answer the people in our district. And so, you know, if they don't see us doing the work, you know, they call us out. You know, there there are there is a system or a process for removal of an elected official within this this office. It is a difficult one, but it is there. It exists, it is, and so yeah. I would I I would always tell people exercise that. Yeah, man. But we're, but to answer your question, I'm here to do something different. I'm here to listen, mm -hmm. um, and I'm here to lead. But mm -hmm. I, but the most the first one is the most important one to listen. Right. Because there's so many right, people right, that. Right. They don't really listen. They'll tell you they listen. They'll take some notes down. But are they really consuming the information and, and that you're, that you're providing to these individuals? Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to change. That's what I. That's what I'm here to do. Uh, you know, like I said on the campaign trail, you know, I want to modernize how we communicate. You know, with folks, how we, yep. how the community and the police communicate. Yep. Um, and and that's what I bring to the table. Um, do you, Do you think that like representation is one of those things that that helps that that kind of is a bridge for the communication, right? Because like, if somebody comes from, uh, uh, let's say, from outside of the community. And they come in, right? And they're trying to sell to the people. Hey, I want you to buy what I'm selling. And they don't look like them. They don't talk like them. They, you know, sometimes they, there's a disconnect, right. right? And then if that person does get elected, well, then the community doesn't trust them even more because right. once they see how selfish they are, they're like, okay, you're just another outsider who's coming in right. for his own selfish reasons. But like some someone like yourself, you know, who you look like the people from the area in which you're in. You know, you grew up in the Chicagoland area, so you're a reflection of, of the communities that were built here. Does that make a, a big difference when it comes to uniting the community? I, I definitely say it does. Unfortunately, I think it's a double-edged sword because we, we do <coughs> want people that look like us to represent us, specifically in areas where folks look like us, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether that be a racial complexion or, or a socioeconomic background, mm -hmm. um, we want that, right? And that's it, that makes it easier for us to relate with those individuals and support those individuals. Mm -hmm. But I think... 
too often we've seen that there are folks that look like us, right? right. Come from the same backgrounds, but they're not in it for us. Right. Right. And even though they look like us, they're operating for their own yeah. gain. Right. And we see it happen all the time. And so it, that's tough because as minorities, we want to balance that. And we want to try and balance like, We do want that representation, representation right. right? That's what we're fighting for, representation. Right. But right. we need the proper representation. And I think that falls on us to make sure that we're vetting folks to the best of our abilities to make sure there's not another George Santos. Because there's a lot more George Santos out in the world than people realize. Right. Let, me just get, let me throw that out there. No, like, yeah. he, that is not an isolated incident. That person is not an isolated incident. Right. There are way more George Santoses in government or elected positions or just leadership positions that, than we know out there. Yeah. And it really, really falls on the community to vet. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, I love to see people with black and brown faces that represent me, but I just want to make sure, and as every, I hope everybody else does, feels the same way, is that we just want to make sure it's the right black and brown faces that are going to be there for us. I agree. To be there for the community when we need them, not when it's, like, convenient. Right. No, I agree. No, that's very well said, man. Very well said. Yeah. So, and then, so to segue, what has been your experience with the campaign trail? Because I, I had a buddy in college, and he majored in political science, and he was there for the whole Obama run which was pretty dope yeah it was, it was but um what what has your experience been like in the campaign trail in chicago or i don't know if you did anything in aurora but if you did what what has those experiences been like so my camp my my original like introduction into campaigning in politics was actually in aurora mm-hmm. i actually a lot of people don't know i actually ran for school board i ran for the east Aurora district 131 school board oh nice um and i was green i think i was like what, like 21 at the time <laughs> maybe 22 and so um, you know, me being a young buck, hard headed, you know, like I got it. So I you know, try to read everything. I was like, okay, you need 50 signatures. You got to go grab this packet. Well, I didn't realize that, um, you know, you want to get more than the recommended amount of signatures because if you get challenged, you have a higher probability of surviving a challenge. And what I mean by being challenged is like, if let's say an individual doesn't live in a specific area where you have to get, you can only get signatures from a specific region, right? Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes people don't realize that they're not within a specific region, right? They might just be like a hair outside of that line, right? Mm -hmm. But they're ineligible. For me, the situation was, you know, I had folks from my church uh, sign uh, my petition, um, but a couple, unfortunately, a couple of them were undocumented, and they didn't know their status. Mm. And so when that got brought up, um, you know, it was made that they made known that they were undocumented. So it brought me below. I think I had like 51 signatures. You needed 50, mm. right? So I think it was like four individuals. And so they brought oh. me down. I got taken to court. Uh, yo, shout out to, to Alderman, former Alderman Judge Lafshe for representing me on the fly, man. I appreciate it. We lost that case, but you had that dog in you that day, baby. I loved it. I loved the effort. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> that man argued his yes, life sir. out for me. That's um, good stuff, <laughs> you know, I appreciate You it. need people like that, man. You do. You do. You shout out to Judd, like man. That. Real talk. I appreciate that. Um, That's what's up, man. And, that was wild. Like I, I got kicked off the ballot, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it was a kind of a traumatic process. But you know, I left that, I left that courthouse with my head held high because you know what, I had never in my life thought that I would be able to do something like that. So it was, it was still a win regardless of how I took mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Now, did I think that I ever get back into politics again? Absolutely not. I was like, man, this is vicious, this is brutal, it's kind of crazy. And this is, mm-hmm. a, I was a roar, bro. It was yeah. a school board, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, an unpaid position. Yeah. Um, but fast forward now, I really, honestly, I think it was that experience that helped give me that, like that slight edge yeah. honestly that a lot of folks that i seen you know were campaigning for this similar position didn't really have mm-hmm. um yeah and, and so th- the second time around you know <laughs> i feel like i went from roar didn't make it chicago this is the big leagues yeah i was gonna opinion. say right yeah, I mean, yeah, that, going, that type of yeah you're going, you know from, I mean? <laughs> you're going from the minors man to the big leagues you know? honestly you know uh, what i'm saying and so um it was a little it was a little daunting but i do the, the experiences that I took from the school board situation was like mm. read everything, strategize way in advance, mm. make sure you have a complete understanding of what the expectations are. Um, and, and that definitely helped keep me afloat. I will say that because there's, there's challenging times. Like this is Chicago. It's a whole different ball game. You know, yeah. there's a lot of mistrust. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Everything's amplified. Whatever you're dealing with in the, right. in the, in the city of Aurora, right. amplify that time center in Chicago. Right. No, makes and sense. yes, that, that was tough, man. There was, listen, we talk. We talk about Mamba mentality, right? Yeah. Mamba mentality in a positive way. Yeah, right, you right. know, I I was out there, and you know, the worst part about this was this election. Pro- the process was in the middle of winter. It's cold as hell. Yeah. So like, I'm standing out, Mariano's, both like three. I get off of work. I go mm. make my wife dinner, mm. and then for two hours, I'm sitting outside of Mariano's trying to get petitions. Wow. And and for me, I had to gather. I had to gather. Four hundred, yeah. but they obviously say in Chicago you want triple that. So I was trying to get like sixteen hundred signatures yeah. Yeah. at Mariano's at night, man. In this, yeah. I was at night in the snow. I mean, yeah. there was one time like they just like pour like an inch of snow, and I'm out there, man. I was just getting signatures, like walking. You know yeah. what I mean? So no, yeah. It, but Put that was skin in the game. Yeah. 
No, yeah, and it, well, it's, that's something that we do talk about on the podcast is like mentality, mindset, and you know, I'm glad you brought up your experience when you were 21 and 22 because we talk about all the time, man. Like you're gonna bump your head. I don't care what you do, what pursuit, what what uh, what passion or what purpose you try and pursue, you're gonna bump your head. But hopefully, you can bump it enough when you're early so that when you're closer to our age, like that that life experience now, it 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 uh it comes full circle. Completely, you know, it helps and you got you. you got thicker skin now. All you day. know, you're not you're not All as uh, you know, you're not as easily moved or easily swayed. You know, you're much more grounded in who you are as an individual, and it's because of all of those experiences. All day, I mean, adversity really builds you. You know, and like I've said before, pressure makes diamonds. And so, you know, if you if you know you you have that value, man, you just gotta you accept that pressure. Um, yeah, because it it comes with it. If you're not if you're not taking L's, if you're not if people aren't laughing at you, then you're not really trying. And I've said that before. I've said it's to true. college students before. It's like, look, you're gonna get laughed at. You're gonna take some L's. You're gonna fall down. It, it is a process of success. You mm-hmm. cannot, you know, very rarely in life can you get success without actually getting hit beat up you know mm-hmm. by life taking those l's like that's 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 part of it like if, if and the way i look at it is like that's like paying your dues you True. know i look at it as paying your dues and we all have to do that you know like we you can't expect success without any type of sacrifice mm-hmm. it's always some sort of sacrifice with it mm-hmm. and with mm-hmm. that we'll take a quick break cool yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It'll be a hundred dollars a minute right, yeah. right. next time we, we see this guy standing at the door right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Nobody yeah. Can come got to come service come in. Come on, yeah <laughs> Oh man! All right, we're back from the break, man. And uh, so let, let's let's keep it going, man. You were talking about life experience, taking L's, and stuff like that. Um, talk about a little bit of some of the L's you took growing up um, to get you where you are today. Uh, man, I mean, one of them was failing for you know failing a failed attempt at trying to get on the school board. Um, mm. You know, that was my first like political L. Um, you know, I remember when I went to go work for the West Aurora School District. Um, you know, that just didn't work out for me. And that was a, a really big situation for me. I was dealing with a lot of things in that, in that role that were affecting me men- like in terms of my mental health. And, you know, I had to step away from that situation. And that, to me, that was a huge professional, uh, I thought I was never going to recover from, you know? Um, but again, I, I would go back and do it all the same because it, 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 it motivated me, um, to pursue my master's degree, which ultimately was such a blessing in disguise for me and kept me focused in really, you know, dark times. I mean, we went through a pandemic, you yeah. know, the only thing that I had going for me, I was unemployed. So the only thing that, that kept me going was, you know, trying to finish my master's degree. Um, you know, I, a lot of people don't know, but I actually applied for a cannabis business license as a social equity applicant. I built a whole, we built a whole framework for a business. We raised a little over like $500,000, all black and brown money. Um, wow. And, you know, we were one of the very few teams, excuse me, to actually make it to the finish line. And when I say finish line, like actually get into the lottery, not once, but twice, um, you know, and that's off the score that we got. I mean, we got a better score than people that actually had licenses and actually only, actually had brick and mortar dispensaries in other states. Wow. Um, and so, you know, those are, we didn't, we didn't make it. And some people might look at that as an L. I look at it as a dub though. I mean, you know, again, we didn't talk about it. We went on and, and did the damn thing. And, and I'm proud of every single teammate that, that I, I had on there. Um, we, we did great stuff. Um, I mean, those are just some of the L's. I mean, I could talk about, you know, if we want to go back to like high school, I got. Yeah, I was going to say, well, what about mm-hmm. some ch- childhood L's oh. that you took that kind of shape your mindset? Because we all we all go through our own stuff and then mm-hmm. and then, um, you know, it puts you in a, in, in a mindset so that when something else comes up as you get older, mm-hmm. you're just like, wow, that ain't nothing. I already I already been through the trenches, <sighs> trenches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. honestly. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's my turn to a therapy session. Yeah. <laughs> it can be very on the surface, <laughs> yeah. man. No, we just listen. You know, covering very it on was the surface. my teenage years were tough. Like you know, I struggled a lot in school, and not because like I was not intelligent. It struggled because like you know the school district that I was in at the time. It just it wasn't that great of a school district. I got to be flat out. Like you know, the foundation that I w- I received was very shoddy, and that really um, hurt me. You know, throughout my career, you know, from middle school all the way to to college. Honestly, like mm-hmm. you know. Um, and that was th- so real quick though, real quick. Now that you're saying, cause you went through public school, right? Yeah. So now that you have a son, hmm. what is your take on that? Cause we talk about it mm-hmm. private versus right. public and my, my children are in private cause I refuse to send them to public school. Fair enough. I just don't agree with it. Fair enough. <clears throat> what, what's your, uh, how do you feel about that? Man, it's tough. Cause you know, I know private school, it costs, it, it costs a lot of money. Um, but I, honestly, like, you know, my wife and I've had the conversation cause you know, she, she's very much aware of my situation when I went through and what I went through in public school. Mm-hmm. You know, I really, I really think it, ha- it comes down to the parents being involved as well. Like, you know, not everybody can send their kid or afford to send their kid to private school, but I think where the, 
if you have the ability, right, to to step in and, and be that that overseer, you know, and watch yeah. and maintain a, a watchful eye over your child, right, then that's going to have to be something that you're going to have to step up and do. You know, for me, whether they go to private or public, like I plan to, to, to be present um, to make sure um, – that they're getting the education that one they deserve and that two we paying for because whether it's, it's private or public we paying for that bad boy right so right. you know i want to make sure that they're getting because they're, they're getting what they deserve um because here's the thing you know i even though i didn't have the best experience in, in school when i was in school there were still teachers that slid out right there were still individuals right. where i was like yeah that person right there yeah, yeah shout out to miss Sieber, um shout out to miss denude rock with y'all miss helvey love y'all um and those are some of the individuals right there yeah um that I, i'm naming off top that, that really helped me out mm -hmm. um and so I, I know that if my kid goes through public, there's probably going to be some of those individuals. And so how do we empower those individuals? How do we support those individuals uh, to make sure that that type of education experience doesn't just end when my kid walks out of their classroom, but it continues when they walk into the next person's classroom and so on and so forth. And I think that gap is bridged by the parents themselves. Right. Checking in. OK, well, what are you learning? And then can mm -hmm. I be an accessory to this education? Right. Can mm -hmm. I also add because we're teachers mm -hmm. straight, you know, straight facts. We're teachers as well. We might not look at it as like, you know, we're educational teachers. But if anything, we're teaching our kids more than what the teachers they're seeing for like two, three hours at a time or an hour you know, at a time might be, you know, because they're with us all the time. So mm -hmm. you have to also look at yourself as an educator. What are you teaching your child? Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I think about all the time. You know, um, now that he's getting a little older, I have to think about, you know, some of the, the music that I listen to and, you know, movies that I watch. But mm -hmm. I, I look at myself as an educator for him. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that that's kind of that's kind of I guess like my take on it. Yeah, no, no that's a good take on it. No, it is. It is. And like, you know, is there and I know it I know it's early, right? Cuz he's he's only, you know, 13 months like right. you said. But um with with you doing everything that you're doing now, what do you want him to take away from everything that you're doing now when he gets older? Cuz you know, there may become a day where he looks back and watches something like this to see like what you were like in those what early you, you know, in those early days and go, "Wow, you know, <clears throat> My dad's come a long way. I mean, honestly, the one thing I want my kid to take away is don't ever let that dog inside you die, man. Like, I think for me as an individual, knowing the things that I've gone through, the challenges that I faced, it was always that fire. You know, I always look at it. I always think about like Pokemon, like a Char like the uh, not Charizard, um, Charmander. You know, their, okay, yeah. their, their life force is, is attached to the flame on their tail. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, I, I look at it the same way. It's like as long as that fire keeps going and raging, man, you got a shot. You know what I'm saying? You just gotta you gotta lean into that flame you know, and put your faith into it. Um, but don't don't be afraid to be an independent thinker. Don't be afraid. Uh, you know, if you if you want to go against the grain, don't be afraid to go against the grain because the masses are going to the left and you want to go to the right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's what I want. I hope that my son takes away and my future children as well take away from me is like, you know, that like pops really was an independent voice um, and that he was an independent thinker. Um, and that he did that because he cared, mm -hmm. um, and he didn't just want to just go with the flow. Right. You know, um, I want to I want to be part of history. Um, I don't want just witness history. I want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So I hope that my kid takes that away and and and, and you know elevates that. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then when you were, <clears throat> excuse me, when you were going through all this, did you have a mentor or a coach um, that kind of helped keep you on track? You know, from those days where you're like, nah, man, I'm done, I'm mm -hmm. done. Um, I mean, I I would say I had people like there were mentors, right? But they're kind of like seasonal. Like people will come in my life, you know, they teach what they need to teach people, and you know, they would go wherever. Um, but for me, it was really I, I look at it, I look at it as an individual as a mentor, regardless of whether they believe they're a mentor or not, because mm -hmm. each individual has something to teach us, mm -hmm. um, and I, I I believe that firmly. And so that I will say that there was individuals throughout my life that I took from, right? I think as a kid. For me, at least, my persona came from me taking pieces that I like from individuals around me. I might not take the whole concept of this individual, right? But mm -hmm. there's something that I like about this individual and I want to insert into my life to help make me better. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how, how I went about it. Yes, there were some people that stood, that stayed longer mm -hmm. as a guide. Um, but for the most part, yeah, you know, it was, it was really taking those pieces of folks that I really like, you know, this person taught me to really be on time mm -hmm. that's a great concept i want to take that from them let's mm -hmm. be on time right. mm -hmm. you know this individual taught me discipline um okay and why is this one so important i see that okay let me take that real quick you know this person is a really great speaker i love the way they enunciate i love the way they're so confident mm -hmm. i like that i want to do that too as well let me take that let me learn from that yeah. um and so that's kind of how, how how it was really for me 
Who's who's like um, someone that right now it doesn't necessarily have to even be in the political realm, but just someone that you look up to right now as far as you know everything that they're doing, um, and that you can kind of pull like exactly what you just said that you pull from. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple. I don't I don't have one specific individual. Um, I love what Mayor Brand Johnson has done. You know, he was such an underdog. And even though I didn't vote for him the first time, mm-hmm. um, you know, I really appreciate the message that he's he's been given out. And even though he's faced criticism, like he still stood firm on on his messages. And so I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I think I, I hold on. I don't want to butcher his name, but mm-hmm. mental health is a big thing for me, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to in regards to men. As mm-hmm. you, see, you know, see my my IG, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, John Fetterman um, okay. in, in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, he's somebody that not only do I love his political campaign, but I love the fact that he really embraced like, look, I have mental health challenges, man. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's normal. And mm-hmm. we're just going to it's going to be normal. And right. that's going to be part of my identity as a politician, right. um, regardless of whether you like it or not. And I'm so happy that he's normalized or at least is fighting to normalize men's mental health and that we all struggle with that. So for me, right. I've talked about him a couple of times. Like, you know, he's definitely been somebody that I've looked up to because, like, yeah, we need to normalize men having conversation about their mental health like yeah. we struggle a lot more with it than people are really mm-hmm. willing to admit mm-hmm. um and i've been super happy that he's been he's been one of the, the strongest voices i think for men in leadership positions talking about like their struggles mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. he's he's definitely one um i would you say keeping it real my grandma my grandma like all the women in my life i'm gonna keep it a buck like they're probably the when people think about the confidence right that i have yeah. i think it really yeah. comes from from the women in my family man it's just straight yeah. up like doing what they got to do to get things done right yeah. regardless of the challenges yeah. um and that's really what i've drawn on that for the entirety of my life man um so i would have to shout them out shout out to mom grandma my aunt my cousins nice. um yeah that's what's up man yeah man and i think something too man that we uh you realize as you get older is you there's there's a there's a special kind of love that women give off, you know? It's like the divine feminine energy that you just can't, you know, with, with us, the guys, man, that's a different kind of love, right? Like right. a brotherly love, right. a brotherhood love. Right. Right. But like that real just warmth, yeah. can't you can't replace that, man. Yeah. Like you can't. And in those moments where, man, you're having an episode or you're having like some mental health issues, man, women – don't even real. I mean, some of them do, yes, but they really don't realize how much power they truly, truly have with just having a small conversation with you and seeing that, hey, I just need to give this young man a little bit of life. Right. You know, I don't have to spend money or anything like that. I just got to give him a little bit of love and attention, and it can go such a long way. You know. No, I mean that's facts. I mean, I've when I was when I was campaigning, you know, one of the things that kept me going was thinking about my, my grandma was in dialysis uh, for like. 13 14 years man mm-hmm. and you know she would she was a housekeeper at the hospital at mercy old mercy so mm-hmm. she would get up at 5 a.m go do dialysis which drains you right mm-hmm. then go work another like eight hours come back make food i'm like bro like that's there's no way this is a weak individual this right. is an extremely strong individual that's doing all of this mm-hmm. keeping it going like you know like it's nothing mm-hmm. so i would think about that man it's you then you know we talk about mama mentality when we talk about mamba mentality i'm thinking grandma got it grandma had the, the coin yeah. term before kobe right. was alive right. you know right. what i'm saying right. so right. Right. i right. drew on that you know she probably could have beat Kobe one on one with that probably. kind of mentality. Well, sure. you know? We're gonna go ahead and for the for the podcast and say <laughs> yeah, grandma, yeah. she would hold it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. So tell us tell us a little bit about like uh you were talking about your position in office. Uh so tell us a little bit about that and then I got another question for you right after. So we're I'm one of uh the first cohort of district counselors for the city of Chicago. And so what district council is, um, it was an ordinance that was passed. And it creates two two things. One is the district councils, which are three local, locally elected individuals from each of Chicago's 22 police districts. Um, and then it creates the commission, which are seven individuals that represent us on more like a higher level in terms of like the superintendent of police and then the mm-hmm. mayor. Um, and there's only seven of them. So we, cr- we as an entity are called the Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability, which is an it's a, original, all brand new office um, that exists to represent the community in regards to you know, all things policing in the city of Chicago. Mm. Policing in Chicago in the city of Chicago has been a very controversial hot topic for a number of years. Um, you know, this all really starts from, you know, the Illinois, state of Illinois suing the city of Chicago, specifically CPD, um, for some of its, well, not for a lot of its misuse of power mm-hmm. and misconduct. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, once they sued them, 
CPD had to adhere to guidelines, right, that were mm-hmm. implemented by the state. So they have things that they have to, duties that they have to fulfill. Mm-hmm. So another part of this was then the community said that put, like, we're kind of, we want more representation. And so they pushed for this ordinance, which created our office. And so for the first time ever, the city of Chicago, regular individuals have three representatives that represent them in all things related to policing and police matters. That's awesome, um, man. So yeah, Step so in the right direction, few, man. Congratulations on me. Yeah, you know? congrats. Seriously, that is big. So with, with, with that being a hot topic, how do you how do you plan on going about working with people with the different views? Because it, 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 there's no middle. No. It seems like there's no middle. It's either you're on one side or you're on the other. It's tough because I am the middle. <laughs> I'm the one. Yeah, right? I'm like kind of the one in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Um, and no, but you, you touched on something. It's true. You know, there are a lot. There's a wide range of viewpoints, right? Like we have people that are extremely progressive and we have people that are extremely conservative, right? Um, and there's we've seen those, you know, two parties bump heads. But for me, um, given, you know, look, I've had bad. I've had bad issues with police before. You know, I've been in a couple of police raids. You know, I've been I've been hit with DWB mm-hmm. um, a couple of times. Um, you know, those things really happen. They're not they're not a myth. They happen. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, like when I took this position, I had to remove my personal feelings. Right. And put instead ahead of uh, or put ahead the feelings of the community. Right. So for me. It's really about representing the community. And and the second district, which is like Bronzeville, High Park, Mm. Oak Park, Mm. um, Kenwood, Washington Park. Um, It's a very big area, but it's a very diverse area. Even though it's like predominantly black, Mm. there's there's black folk from all different types of socioeconomic backgrounds, from, you know, people that are, you know, um, lower income to people that are very affluent, right? Mm. Um, And so with that comes varying degrees of of viewpoints on the police. Mm -hmm. Some people in the more affluent areas, which pretty predictable are more Mm. in favor of police they want better partnerships people in the lower income areas typically don't want to hang out with police they Mm. they, they're not in favor for you know mixing with the police and working Mm. with them and Mm. rightfully so again each area has its challenge Mm. um but for me the reason why i try to stay in the middle ground as a centrist is because like i don't believe that one side is right i don't believe i think there's there's truths on both sides yep um and we have to come at things from as bi- uh, like unbiased as possible right, right? and right, i try right. to rely on data i try to rely on firsthand accounts because here's the thing no one's perfect no one's perfect and people are going to mess up we're going to make mistakes um but i want to i want to know that i'm giving the best foot forward and the best effort possible mm-hmm. without injecting my own personal opinions and feelings into the situation mm-hmm. there's enough of that already out mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. and then i'm not saying that that's wrong i don't want to sit there and say that, like the passion but there's a time and a place. Right. right. There's a time and a place for that passion to come out and, and take over. Mm-hmm. But as an elected official now, I understand that it's not about me. It's about right. us. Right. And there are those of us who like working with the police and, and appreciate what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And there are those of us that don't. Mm-hmm. And and, bo- and they're not wrong. Your, right. your opinion's not wrong. Right. Your opinion's not wrong. Right. The two truths can exist on the same plane of existence. True. But let's get to the meat. Let's get to the to the to the meat of the subject. Why do you not like the police? Now, right. why do you like the police? Okay, right. where can we find common ground? What are the issues that you're having? How can mm-hmm. we accommodate? How can we bring up your level of safety and, and, and sentiment regarding your community and, and police at the same time too? Right? Because for me, the way I look at it is like there there's an underlying factor for why these folks over here don't really rock with the cops. Let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Let's see. And not let's talk. Let's actually commit to some action. Right. what can we do to help raise that up right because mm-hmm. it's so low right so what can we do so yeah it's it's tough but the reason why again why i play the middle is because like you know i i, I again i think there can be truth on both sides and right. if i commit to just one side then i'm neglecting the possibility of truth on the other side right and now i'm becoming with somebody yeah you, you're becoming the same thing you're trying exactly, to stop exactly you know? exactly right yeah but that's just me no yeah and it's tough it's tough to remain objective and it's tough to um also not allow yourself to become overly emotional right because on one side right you 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 talk about like let's say the the an experience that someone from a lower income neighborhood or area comes from that they have with the police right and they have a really really bad experience it's hard to hear someone go through something like that and to not feel for them right, right? and to not get just as upset as they are right but to say like i hear you but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden we can just run to the other side and show up with, you know, with baseball bats and, and you know, ready right, to, right, you know, right, take down right. City Hall. Like, yes, the, the 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 feeling and the emotion is there, but that's not the, the logical or rational way to approach this, you know. 
but and sometimes baseball bats are no let me not say that yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes the passion <laughs> right they the just need to be directed the, right right in right. a way that's right. it's healthy they, and constructive listen, if folks is acting a fool and you know what the only only option that we got is we need to organize because sometimes need, yeah you got to do that that's the that's the route yeah. but the opportunity but that that option will present itself right you don't have to force right. it it's gonna right. come right. Right. you can see right. it coming right. right that's all i'm saying right no you're right you're right so what's your future or what's the future vision either for the city of Chicago or do you plan on coming back home and doing something here? Man, I don't know. That's it's something that my wife and I talk about all the time, but I, I love where we're at, man. Like, you know, I love, I love being in Bronzeville. Again, shout out to Bronzeville. I love being there. It's such a beautiful community, man. Um, you know, I, I'll say this because it's funny because, like, in the community garden, right, you know, people – they congregate, right? So I've met some of the neighbors and the, the the leaders of the local block club. And the first time that we were hanging out, I met this guy's son. He's he's one of the the guys that manages the block club. I met his shots email. Um, I met his one of his sons, and we were talking and whatnot. He's he just asking me questions like, "How do you love the neighborhood and whatnot?" I was mm-hmm. like, "Man, bro, real talk." I was like, "This is like Neighborville to me." You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I was like, minus all the white folks, I was like, you know, "Everybody's <laughs> just black." Um, you know, I was like, "This is like Neighborville to me." And so, for some people like looking on the outside in that have like from the suburbs, they like, they probably laugh like, oh, "Yeah." Serious? But for me, like knowing some of the areas I grew up, I grew up on the east side in the '90s, man. It was a very bad time to be a minority living on the east side in the '90s. You know. I've had six family members shot, three killed, you know, and so that was, those are some of the backgrounds that I come from. Th- that neighborhood, the neighborhood I live in right now was the first place in my life that I lived in for a whole year, didn't hear no gunshots. Wow. No gunshots. I wow. lived in, I lived in Pilsen. I lived in Bridgeport, two other two neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, Bridgeport, people think it's like, there's nothing but cops. There was a drive-by. I'm taking a time test. I was, I think it was on Easter. Was, I'm taking a time test. I did a drive-by, like right in front of my, in front of the apartment I was living in. So, yeah. That's why, and when I told um, Emil's son that, he literally looked at me with like this face, man. Like, really? I'm like, yeah, bro. This is this is a beautiful neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And he was like, that says a lot. And and I know it might sound weird, it, but to me, like I said, like that's a neighborhood worth fighting for. That's a community mm-hmm. worth fighting for to maintain that level of safety and feeling. Because like I feel safe when I walk. I mean, other people they they, they have their opinions, but look. There, there's upteen drive-bys when I was living on Grove Street. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was living on Sophisburg, it was there was Latin Kings that lived in the surrounding houses. They all got shot up all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. So, violence is nothing new to me. I've lived and grown up in violence my entire life. Mm-hmm. This is the first place that I've lived in, like I said, where I did not hear a single gunshot or drive-by mm-hmm. for an entire year. Mm-hmm. I don't even think I still have. I've been there longer <laughs> than a year now. I still don't yeah, think I've heard yeah. a gunshot. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. And and. If you come from that, then you appreciate why you want to sure. maintain that. You appreciate why um, you want to maintain that level of safety and sentiment. Um, and that's sure. where that's worth fighting for. So, yeah, I mean, that neighborhood is beautiful, man. I love it. I really do. The houses are dope. The, the neighbors, I mean, the neighbors alone make me want to just stay there long term. So I hope we're looking. It's a little pricey. I ain't going to lie to you. Mm-hmm. We rent right now. But we're, we've been steadily looking because we want to make a long-term investment there. I think it's, it's a great enough place where I would raise my kid. Right, and, and right, if I'm right. and if I'm saying that as a father, as a first time father, then yeah. you know it's a, you know it's a good true. spot. True, and th- so what what would be the I guess because you grew up here and we talked about it on the last episode mm-hmm. uh, with or not the last episode, a couple of episodes with Nick, and we talk about how people shout out to Nick, yeah, shout out Nick. Mm-hmm. We talk about how people, you know, reach a level of success and they leave and they never come back. Community um, retention, man. Yeah, so. You know, seeing as what you're saying, you know, you left, but, you know, it doesn't sound like you're coming back to help, like, the people where you grew up in, which you could probably maybe change, maybe you can't, but what's the reasons for you not wanting to come back? You know, it's not, I don't want to say it's not that I, I don't want to come back, it's just, like, my life has taken me here, right? Because for, I, I wrestled with this, I wrestled with this very question for a very long time to the point where it would get me depressed, man. Like, did I abandon mm. my, t- my town? Man, did you I, left us, man. I, <laughs> come on, LeBron. And there's some people that will say that. There's yeah. some people that say that. Yeah. But, then, but then for me, I had to really think about what did I invest into this community before, prior to my departure? Right. I started a scholarship by myself. Right. Uh, not by myself, I'm sorry, take that back. No, my, uh, my, uh, my scholarship associate would be disappointed if I said that. Yeah. Yeah. I started it, I started out the process by myself, managed to uh, recruit an individual, and we had a scholarship for a couple of years. Um, not only that, but I worked for the city of Aurora. I mean, some of the some of my 
the 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 start in government came from here and it started from helping people in the community mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. my passion for for being in the community doing community work came from the city i uh, the the hesse house uh, food pantry i volunteered there for years i think malcolm maybe actually came and did a we, i had a i would organize haircuts for the homeless mm-hmm. and do makeup mm-hmm. stuff for them mm-hmm. you know and i had tons of barbers that would come out and so like i've given a lot to the community you know, in terms of blood, sweat, and tears. So my, mm-hmm. like I said, I have family members here that, that have been laid to rest here. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, is that a flash? Oh, we're good. Yeah, yeah we're 60. good. Yeah, the first first time, you know, continue with what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Um, you know, so for me, it's not about not wanting to come back. It's just I feel like my time, I serve my time here. And the city, this, it's east side all day, baby. Come on now. It's, <laughs> no one's going to take that from me. But. The yeah. city gave me what I needed to continue moving on forward. And mm-hmm. sometimes that's sometimes we can make our legacy in our hometown. That's right. great. Shout out right. to you mm-hmm. if you can. Mm-hmm. But sometimes mm-hmm. we have to we have to leave the communities to make that legacy that yep. we want. Yeah, because because something yeah. I was going to was going to add to what you just said was um, now that I think about it. Yes. You know, would we all love to see um, individuals stay here in the city and continue to build the infrastructure? Yes. But something else that I thought about just just while I'm listening to the conversation is that you also need allies in different spaces and in different Ooh, places. Yeah. Right? right. So you being not completely out of the state of Illinois, but just, you know, 45 minute drive, up the road. you're yeah. still you're still close enough to where right. you can have an impact on your community whenever yep. you so choose, you right. know. And also, too, I think that and this is just a testament to life. This is just a testament to being a man and being a husband, being a father. Now, it's it's. Your family, your wife and your child now are the most important thing, first Thanks. and foremost. Your community is always going to be up there. Always. You know? But you have to do what's best for you, your wife, and your kid now at this point. And if it means moving over here and staying here and still still, still doing the same things, right. you know, building the community, building the infrastructure, but I just have to do it over here now, you know, is, is something that just comes apart with, with, with life, you know? No, you're 100% right. And real, if I could touch on something real quick, mm-hmm. you know, the community retention part, I, mm-hmm. like I said, I wrestled with that, man. But when I was when I moved to Chicago, originally, I was making cheese. I was making real good money. I could have moved to, like, Lincoln Park or, right. you know, Ravenswood, one of those really, really nice areas. Mm-hmm. But I chose to move to Pilsen, mm-hmm. you know, a predominantly Latino area. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I did that specifically because I didn't want to forget my upbringing. I didn't want to forget right. my, my background, you know right. what I'm saying? And so no, no diss to people that do that. If you do that, that's great. But for me, I've always looked at it like, but what what can I contribute to a community like that? Yeah. If I move to Naperville, I'm a dime a dozen, right. you know, out there. Right. I want to make sure that if I'm going to move somewhere, that my talents can be utilized for the community. And so mm-hmm. that's why I chose to look to to move to places that like that look like me. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not affluent areas. They mm-hmm. don't I don't need to live in an affluent area, but I, I just want right. to be in a place where I feel like I'm home. And that right. Bronzeville, Pilsen, yeah. they felt yeah. like home to me, man. And my talents can be utilized here. Like I got elected. Yeah. Case in point, you yeah. know, I got, yeah. I got yeah. elected, and that yeah. would have never happened anywhere else in the city of right. Chicago for me. Right. It happened in this area because my talents can be utilized. And right. The community told me so, yeah. and so I appreciate that. So no, for me, I do believe in community retention, but I'm glad that I didn't move to some like Naperville esque area. You know, mm-hmm. I moved to an area that resembles where I grew up. Mm-hmm. You know, how I grew up and the people that look like me, and I want to commit to the same level of work that I was doing here, mm-hmm. I want to commit to the same level of work there, if not more. And that's something that uh, me being a future father, I've even thought about when it comes to having children, right? Because I was going to ask, you know, being a part of community and having that feeling, like feeling like you're home, is that something you thought about that you also want your son to experience? Oh, all day. You know, that you didn't, you don't want him to grow up feeling out of touch or out of place or, you know, because you know, people don't look like him or talk like him. And there's challenges to work. Like, if you raise a kid in, in like, let's say, like, a Naperville or, mm-hmm. like, a, a Lincoln Park, you know, a very affluent area, right? Mm-hmm. There's going to be pros and cons to that. Regardless. Right. There's going to be different challenges. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For me, the way I've talked about it with my wife is, like, I do want my kid to grow up in reality. Um, you know, I, I want my kid to understand that there are certain challenges in life. And mm-hmm. and it depends on where you are where you come up from, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I think to balance that, you know, my wife and I, we make great money. We're, we're successful. We're, we're successful young adults. Um, and Lord willing, you know, that will continue. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's not going to have a certain challenge that I had because I come from a low income area. I come from right. a low income family. Right. Um, we've, we, you know, we've done good for ourselves. So the challenges that he's going to face are not going to be the same that I, even though right. he might be growing up in an area, well, it's still a nice area than when I was growing up. That's for sure. <laughs> he's, not, <laughs> he's not growing up in the East side of Aurora in the nineties. Right. Um, right. But there's going to be different challenges with that. But for yeah. me, I always want my, my child to be cemented in reality, understand, like, what it really takes, um, how life really works, 
Um, so, but I, I looked at it myself. I'm, I have to be the one to produce that and, mm-hmm. and to give that experience. Mm-hmm. Because again, to your point, we we want better for our kids. Just like my mom right. wanted better for me, like my grandparents want better for them. Right. So that's always going to just be a natural process of life. But I just never want my kid to get so grand, so big headed, or think right, like that they develop this entitled mindset. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. You know, because I we plan on getting him a little debit card. You know, mm-hmm. and making sure that he has a job and he's working. So mm-hmm. I want my kid to work. I want mm-hmm. my kid to have to struggle a little bit. Obviously, mm-hmm. you know, look, mom and dad are there. Right, help out. That's what the that's what the american dream is about mm-hmm. right but i don't want them to grow up to be this entitled jerk where it's mm-hmm. like i deserve everything yeah you know? right yeah i'm not gonna work for anything yeah. no no no. you gotta put in some work buddy just like yeah. everybody else it'll be a little different right yeah. because we we work to make it be a little different for you yeah. but i want i want him to know what you know what it is to to, to get it for himself for sure man and I, as we get towards the end um what what was your vision for aurora before you left and then passing the baton on to Nick. And have you seen that vision kind of go to where you wanted it to go? Or maybe it went a different direction, but it's still just as good as what you envisioned it. I mean, growing up with some of the, the future leaders that are already in positions here, man, the city was always in good hands, man. It was always good. And, 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 Nick, is, and Nick and people like him are a testament to that. You know, they're active. They're engaged. Um, and we live in a situation now where across the country, man, young folks are just not engaged. They're not they're not participating in, mm-hmm. in the politics and the process. Mm-hmm. And hence, you know, why we're in a lot of the situations we're in right now is because like the wrong people get involved. Mm-hmm. And so to see like folks like Nick out there in the trenches, man, getting it and, and, and having fun with it, too. Mm-hmm. The city's in good hands, man. It didn't for me. It didn't matter the direction because I knew it was positive regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, having somebody, you know. I'm honored to even say that Nick was like, you know, my my uh, intern at one point, man. Mm-hmm. That, that, that dude surpassed me t- a couple times. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, it, yeah, the city's in good hands. Um, you know, the, the leadership structure is there. Um, yeah, it's it's in good hands. I mean, there's not much that I, you know. That, yeah, you know, yeah, there's not I mean, much. So, Nick, no, Nick's, 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 Nick's holding it down, man. He is, man. He is. He's he's down. a solid brother, man. He really he is. is. He, he really is. And is. shout out to everybody else like him that's doing doing the work. You know, that's yeah. really what we need. You know, it's it's really just about getting the right folks in the positions and people like Nick, man. Those are the people that you really need to have in in those elevated positions because they really care about the people. Most definitely, man. Most definitely. Shout out to you, Nick. Yeah, shout out, Nick. Yeah. So, what uh, uh, what's some last pieces of advice if there's a young college kid or high school kid wanting to get into politics, what is your last piece of advice for them that you could leave them with? I would say don't be intimidated. You know, I think when we think about politics, we think about these individuals that are like Ivy League grads, you know, mm-hmm. have like the IQ of like Einstein. It's like, you don't got, you don't got none of that, man. <laughs> right, you don't need all I that. know some people that went to Harvard. I'm like, did you really just pay for the, like, right. you could probably just pay for the degree, you know? And so I don't, I, I want people to understand that like, you don't have to come from like a top 10 school. You don't, you don't have to have like this, this or that. You just have to have the passion, dedication, um, and the ability to, to just listen, you mm-hmm. know, and learn and want to be better and want to make your community better. That's all really, that's all you really need, man. And some common sense. Right. I would say common, common sense is probably bit. the <laughs> most important one. Um, but if you got that, I mean, you got the basics to be a great leader, um, you know, and, and, just try it. Don't be afraid. Like I told, like I was telling a, a group of kids um, in North Park, man. You know, if you don't see the way, make the way. Because mm. I think f- too often people look for the the path to be kind of preassembled for them. It's like right. well, sometimes that happens right. where the people have traversed the path. The path is there. You can see it. You just gotta traverse it yourself. Mm. But oftentimes, man, there is no path. You gotta mm. build that bad boy yourself. Mm. Don't be afraid to put in the work. It's going. It's probably gonna take a little bit more. You might deviate here and there, but the path is still being built. You just gotta you gotta see it through, and so don't be afraid, man. Don't don't be afraid to get laughed at. Again, you're gonna take those L's, but if you really if you if you're really passionate, if your heart's really, in the right your place. Your heart's in the right place, man. You're gonna you're gonna get there. You're yeah. gonna get there. I took a couple L's myself, but we know, but we got there, and we're oh, you yeah. know, Lord willing, we're gonna keep going. Yeah, yeah. No, you're 100 percent right, brother. Well, we want to say thank you, man, for taking time out of your day to come and to shoot the podcast with us. Oh, thank y'all. It's you an know, honor. Appreciate everything it, man. Appreciate that you it. have talked about and discussed today fits right in, you know, with what we're doing with the podcast um, and everything that else that we have going on around and everything else that you have going on. So, you know, thank you again. I know you got to get back to the little one because, you know, yeah, you got, got, got a little upset stomach. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sorry, Juju. I told him that you yeah. were you were hurting a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, we can't say thank you enough. And uh, as always, to our viewers and our listeners, thank you for watching and thank you for listening. And we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Peace. Peace.